Welcome, everybody. It's another edition of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. We are a collection of journalists and integrated medicine professionals that like to bring you the latest information about what's going on in the scientific world of lifestyle medicine. We have another print issue out on the street. Uh, our fall issue is out and available. Uh, Dan Wagner has the cover story this time, the, the, uh, the uh, pre-diabetes myth. Very interesting reading. And we've got another, uh, a little bit of video with him in a, in a previous podcast talking about that. Look forward to your favorite health food store, yoga studio, or waiting room of an integrated medicine professional. Look forward online at journaloflifestylemedicine.com. And always be sure to look for our podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, Spreaker, and Stitcher. Coming up in this podcast, I'm so excited about this, Dean Juhan is the author of Job's Body, and uh, just an amazing, amazing intellect, and uh, uh, just a, a uh, well, you'll see. Uh, that's coming up in this podcast. Uh, we've got such an amazing uh, uh, lineup coming up. In two weeks, we've got, I'm sorry, next week, we've got Ralph Stevens. Um, he's another bodywork educator. The thing about Ralph Stevens and Dean Juhan, they're both going to be at the uh, Seven Springs Convention in early November. I think they're both sold out too. Um, Ralph Stevens is uh, going to talk about neural reset therapy. He's also got a, uh, a, a class before that uh, convention, uh, and that'll be at the Pittsburgh School of Massage. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can still get into that. And then in two weeks... Again, very excited about this. Uh, Dr. Michael Greger is going to be with us. He is the medical director behind nutritionfacts.org. If you're not on that subscription list, that is one to get on. Amazing science. This guy puts out two or three videos every week, and we're going to have him captured right here uh, for about 20 or 30 minutes in two weeks. Really excited about that. So uh, before we get to uh, Dean, let's talk about the calendar. Coming up this week, uh, a busy day on Thursday. Thursday is what we've been talking about for a long time now. Um, the visit by Dr. Paul Lamb, that's to the uh, uh, Bethel Park Community Center. And if you want to find out more about that, uh, you have to go to our website. We've got a post about it. Uh, that's with uh, Gurney Bolster's uh, teacher, bringing him in from Sydney, Australia. Dr. Paul Lamb is going to teach about Tai Chi. Also on Thursday, uh, this place downtown, you may have seen it walking by, The Verve 360. Uh, it is the Pittsburgh's first and only health and wellness studio encompassing 360 degrees of wellness. Uh, Thursday is an open house. I think it may be a really fun time to go check out uh, their facility. They claim to be a new model for complete health and wellness, respecting the client. Uh, that'd be you, putting you in charge of your own health. Of course, we know we like that. Uh, and this facility is based on a model of holistic integration with a team approach. This is really exciting. They incorporate nutritional counseling, massage therapy, daily Pilates and yoga classes, facials and waxing, complete health education, stress management, very important, and retail products, uh, augmenting a healthy lifestyle. They're just a 10-minute walk from any place in the Golden Triangle. Uh, that's uh, theverve360.com. Open house all day from 9 to 7. Food and libations from 5 to 7. Um, that's the fun part, the libations. So hope to see you there. And then on the 27th, that's Saturday, in Canton, Ohio, uh, you'll remember the Swami Biandananda, who has been on our podcast, will be showing up at the Merging Hearts Healing Center uh, Saturday night as the Swami, and then Sunday, uh, he and his wife, Steve Behrman, and his wife will be there for a play shop all day. We've been talking about it. He's been on the podcast. That's this weekend, so be sure to check that out if you're going, uh, if you're interested in speaking Cantonese, as the Swami likes to say. Also on... Uh, uh, coming up on October 1st, uh, Dr. Uma Puragala, Dr. Kim Hewitt, and Kim Pierce, RD, are going to be holding a lifestyle seminar at St. Clair Hospital, and that's from 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, you can go to the Integrated Medicine Professionals page on our meetup.com and find out more or uh, register by calling 412-835-6653. Uh, do that by the 26th. Um, 
Also, a couple new events coming up that I think are really interesting. Uh, on October 4th and 5th, the Mid-Atlantic Women's Herbal Conference. Uh, that's going to be held at a farm called the Red Earth Farm. Keynote is Rosemary Gladstar. Anybody interested in herbal medicine, this could be really interesting. It's about a four and a half, dry, a four and a half hour drive uh, from Pittsburgh, redearthfarm.org. If you want to find out more about that, again, that's October 4th and 5th. Then coming up on the October 17th and 19th, uh, just a short drive from Pittsburgh, again, is the Heal Thy Practice Conference, Transforming Patient Care 2014. This is the nation's leading conference on practice development and clinical skills for prevention-focused integrative clinicians and physicians. And of course, we had uh, Eric Goldman on last week on the podcast talking all about that. Really interesting conference. Uh, it'd be great to see a, a nice uh, uh, contingent of Pittsburgh people to make it up there. And then uh, November 2nd through the 4th, we've been talking about it uh, for quite a while, and a lot of it is filled up now. Uh, Pittsburgh School of Massages Fall Conference at Seven Springs. Dean Juhan coming up next. And uh, Ralph Simmons next week. Uh, uh, all going to be here for that. And then on November 6th, this is another fun thing we'll be attending. Uh, Dr. Vonda Wright presents the Women's Health Conversations at the Weston Convention Center Ballroom. Uh, Women's Health Conversations is a gathering for smart, savvy women that will feature a day of education, empowerment, and entertainment to equip you to fortify your body, build a better brain, and prioritize your bliss. Always a good thing to prioritize the bliss. We are igniting, or they are igniting, a national movement about women's health. Uh, join the conversation at womenshealthconversations.com. And that's with uh, Dr. Vonda Wright, a big Pittsburgh celebrity in the wellness world. Uh, another really interesting thing, if you are a body worker of any kind and uh, you find the next conversation with Dean Juhan especially interesting, especially uh, we're going to get into talking about fascia and uh, stru uh, the structural uh, uh, fascia, um, connective tissue. Sorry, I had a little uh, meltdown there for a second. Uh, if you're interested in that topic and want to learn how to work with it as a body worker, Moxie Mind and Body in uh, Market Square is having a training, uh, Anatomy Trains for Movement Therapists. Uh, this is movement therapists. Really interesting. That's going to be taught by Carrie Gaynor. Uh, go to uh, Moxie Mind and Body. I think that's what it is. Moxie Mind and Body and is spelled out dot com uh, to learn more about that. Uh, and then on November 15th, it's Juice Fest. You want to get your tickets for this. This is going to be such a gas. We're going to have uh, juice testing, tasting, uh, and, and a contest to see who's got the best juices, several different categories. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the best juicers in Pittsburgh are going to be there. We're looking for professionals and amateurs. Uh, Journal of Lifestyle Medicine is one of the media sponsors. And uh, Trent Nazipak is going to be on the podcast next week to talk about that. It's going to be a lot of fun. So that looks like it for the calendar for this week. Stay tuned. Dean Juhan uh, first published uh, uh, Job's Body in 1987. That was the first edition. Uh, I believe there have been four since then. Uh, we'll check in with him on that. Uh, it's considered by many to be uh, one of the most important books about body work, not just massage, but body work. And uh, so I'm so pleased and so honored to have coming onto our podcast right now, Dean Ju Juhan. Welcome, sir. Very glad to be here. Thanks so much, Sven. Um, you know, the first thing we should talk about is what, what edition is the book in and um, what, uh, what's the current status of that? Where, where, I know you had talked about in a video in 2011 about maybe wanting to rewrite some things, but are we in the fourth edition right now of that book? Uh, it's third edition. That, okay. Yeah, the one with the blue, with the blue on the cover, is, okay. that's, that's the latest edition. I have one here from uh, the first edition from 1987. Yeah, that's, that's a dinosaur. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't tell that to the person who got it from. Um, <laughs> let's uh, first talk about what uh, we're going to get into a whole lot about, you know, the definitions of massage and body work and all that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, this is a podcast primarily uh, for wellness professionals and the people that want to know what they know. 
what all are you going to be teaching coming up here in November at the Seven Springs uh, CE Conference? Yeah, I'm really excited about that. It's going to be a chance for me to uh, showcase in a conference setting uh, a development of my work that has uh, been coming along in the last five years or so that I call resistance and release work. It's an extension of the work I learned uh, over 24 years of association with Dr. Milton Traeger. And um, a good, uh, a, a large uh, emphasis of the Traeger work is lulling, relaxation, slowing the nervous system down, uh, kind of cleaning the slate of, of uh, latent habituated patterns and all that. But my current uh, passion is, uh, has been around the realization that relaxation is really only half of the picture of building new habits, building new coordination patterns. And that, that requires the active participation of the client, uh, learning to control their muscles, learning to coordinate muscle groups. So in addition to the relaxation, which is the release part, I've added what I call the resistance part, which is asking the client for resistance to attraction, pull away from it, resistance to a compression, push into it. And I design those tractions and compressions to focus on specific vectors through, through synergistic muscle groups and get, get a large group of muscles working together and working in concert and working at full bore instead of just a few motor units firing. And the result is uh, both tremendous uh, ease and range of motion that is reestablished and a sense of strength because we're getting more muscle units firing in a synergistic way. So uh, ease in movement and strength and potency behind that movement and the development of new coordination patterns. That's, that's what my latest development of work has been about. And what kind of uh, what kind of conditions or uh, illnesses or injuries has this been shown really effective for? Oh my goodness, uh, quite yeah. a gamut. <laughs> we don't have enough time to discuss them all. Yeah, I mean, all, all the way from uh, se severe injury or surgery rehab to your generic aches and pains to uh, weakness to uh, overtension. Um, I can lower tone, I can raise tone, I can, uh, basically anything in your somatic structure that's causing you distress and chronic pain, I'll have a run at. And wow. uh, I don't even know yet what it <laughs> won't look for. I'll have that attitude. I'll have a run at it. <laughs> Well, you've uh, you come from a very rich tradition, and uh, you know I, it, it, the the whole uh, Esalon and, and working with Dr. Milton Traeger. Um, I think it's it, it's developed uh, such a deep understanding of the body, and and your your book is really breathtaking in how uh, thank you. you go through so many different systems, uh, and not just the systems, but the synthesis and how they all work together. And, um, you know, really a deep understanding of the consciousness behind all of that that makes it all work. And what I find most fascinating as a journalist is that there's such a gulf between the understanding, uh, you know, your understanding and the people that do this kind of work and the nearly miraculous kind of healings that take place. Um, the, the gulf between that knowledge and what exists when you walk in to see a general practitioner in, in an American uh, medical office. Uh, so I'd like to, you know, kind of touch on uh, some, of the, some of the differences, some of the understandings that you have that wellness professionals of all kinds really should have, you know, some of the basic um, fundamental uh, understandings. But uh, just, just to clear the air on some of it too, I want to Let's go through a quick list of some of the different modalities that have, you know, your your touch on them. There's the Traeger work, there's Feldenkrais, there's, give us some of the other modalities that are very similar to what you're doing. Oh my goodness, modalities that are similar. I mean, just some of the names that people would hear that, you know, if we're talking at the, and, and, a, and a massage therapist says, well, I have this arrow in my toolkit and it's this kind of work, so Certainly anything that involves somatics, the movement, SLN massage. 
Right. Well, you know, a trigger is kind of a thing unto itself. Uh, mm -hmm. How to define exactly what it is and how exactly it's different from many other approaches and modalities is has always been a, kind of a problem because it's mm. it's not a, a it's not a protocol oriented uh, kind of work in the sense that you have a laundry list of moves, you have a formula that you move through like the uh, Rolfing 10 series are all pretty much the same. Uh, like uh, Feldenkrais uh, movement exercises are very precisely defined to do this gesture first, this gesture next, okay. and so on. This is more uh, kind of an open-ended sensory, uh, sensory and movement exploration of what the body will do, what it won't do, how to facilitate what it won't do, how to get things out of the way that it's compulsively doing. And it's, uh, it's a session of exploratory rocking, movement, compression, uh, traction, trying to excite uh, uh, nerve ends in response to movement in all possible scales, mm. small movements, large movements, rapid movements, slow movements. But it's trying to reach... The precincts of the unconscious mind that are setting up our muscle patterns and are is the storehouse of our go-to gestures and our go-to postures and how do we get my my teacher dr milton traeger uh, said over and over and over through his teaching career it's it's all in the mind if we don't reach the mind then nothing of lasting significance is going to change well and this is really the most exciting part i think about your work is that you're you're having an actual conversation between your hands and that unconscious mind of the person Absolutely. on the table. And that's Absolutely. really what makes this work so different than, you know, yes. just the traditional massage of oh, my shoulder hurts, I'll go through this routine, like you said. I think one of the things that I can point to that is, is different in my approach and my attitude and one I very much learned through Dr. Traeger and a lot of masters that I was so privileged to be around it at, in the Esling years. <clears throat> and that's that uh, I'm, I'm using touch not as a physical manipulation per se. I'm using the touch and those physical manipulations as a language. Touch is an extraordinary, extraordinarily rich language. It's our mm. primary sensory organ, our sensory channel. And touch conveys an enormous range of information. It conveys intention, it conveys quality, it conveys attention, and there is a there is a language of touch that we learn to speak together as me as a practitioner and my client as 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 a receiver and a participant. In uh, that right there is almost uh unique within all of medicine that first of all that you would have uh, that deep of a conversation with this consciousness but let's let's talk about how you have that conversation through this touch um, the um, sorry I lost my place a little bit one th let me start in another place here one thing I really want to uh, get as much information as I can from you about is uh, connective tissue, what we might call fascia, and its role in this consciousness within the body. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, fascia, or is it uh, beginning to be called uh, more recently by uh, those who are doing the research and those who are working with it, uh, they are calling it the living matrix. Mm. And fascia is the most uh, prominent, the most ubiquitous tissue in your body. And it is the thing that both holds everything together into a single unit, and it is the thing, it is the medium that divides everything up into this organ, that organ, this muscle belly, that muscle belly. <clears throat> so it is everywhere in the body. And it has... In, in addition to its uh, uh, structural and elastic uh, properties, has an extremely interesting uh, quality in that it is a semiconductor of uh, uh, electromagnetic energy. And it is also a generator of electromagnetic hmm. energy. 
So this medium of electrical conduction and all kinds of uh, semiconductor uh, interconnections and switches on, switches off, gates, uh, you can talk about it in some kind of uh, electrical technical terms in some way because it is like a vast computer chip that's holding you all together in there. So a lot of the thinking now is that the connective tissue system with its energetic properties was the first communicating medium between cells in multicellular organisms and as such was the precursor of the nervous system. Hmm. So in addition to the neural uh, messaging system and the central nervous system with all of its neurons, we have uh, enwrapped around that system uh, this connective tissue system that is also passing electrical signals uh, back and forth from all precincts of the body, from every cell to every other cell. So it's not only a, a significant structural tissue that holds us together and gets in its own structural uh, problems and injuries and whatnot, but it is a, a large reservoir of the transfer of information that uh, constitutes the unconscious mind as our organism organizes itself and directs itself and learns and teaches and so on. Mm -hmm. So does this um, then kind of become, you know, in metaphysical terms, as I learned uh, energy medicine, and then as certainly after I had a, a, the full rolfing session, uh, this whole concept that emotions get stuck in our body, get stuck in our field, get stuck in our system, would it be most accurate to say they're actually stuck within the connective tissue? Well, I wouldn't want to put a specific locus on, on a memory. For one thing, nobody really knows where memory resides. Uh, of, all the, of all the ways they can measure and test memory, uh, what's absent is some clear anatomical functional locus of where memory happens or where memory is stored. Mm -hmm. My own sense of it is that memories are stored in every system in our body that we have a biochemical homeostasis that strives to maintain how it remembers it's supposed to be. We have connective tissue that uh, has a memory, uh, in most simple terms, uh, something like a rubber band on the structural sense. Mm. When you stretch a rubber band and let it go, it remembers how long it was without tension on it, sure. and it snaps back into place. Then, of course, there are sensory memories, there are emotional memories, there are cognitive memories, and I see all of those as a, as a gestalt that are feeding each other, working off each other, uh, modifying each other, and so I wouldn't want to say our emotional memories are stored in connective tissue per se or stored in the prefrontal cortex per se. Hmm. It's, it's stored in this entire hologram that, yeah. is, that is our being. Well, I think you, trying to separate it out, maybe you fall right into the trap of Western medicine and trying to isolate things when, as you said, you're working with the whole gestalt. Would this, would this kind of explain why some of these habits are so difficult to break? And, and why getting into the soft tissue and doing some of these deep manipulations like rolfing have such a profound effect on the emotions? Yes, yes. And if we come back to the thought that it, it really is all in the mind, and by mind I don't mean just what the brain is doing, I mean by mind the whole organic gestalt of all of our body systems working together to produce consciousness and the qualities of consciousness and the memories of consciousness, um, I, I, what was, what was, where did that question start? Yeah. <laughs> so this is where I, the, the, the subject is so mind boggling when you start to As, yes, figure out, I mean, I, I believe I've saw an interview with you. You said, when you, the more you start to learn about the body, the more profoundly in awe you are about how amazing it all works together. Yes, and I don't find science, uh, while it gives us oodles of information about cells and about structures and about tissues and about physiological functions and, and, and all the rest of it, I, I have no fear that uh, science is ever going to dispel the deep mystery that is consciousness mm -hmm. and is memory and is our, is our life. Mm -hmm. The closer they look, 
the weirder it gets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there's another aspect to your work, I think, that is really profound and really good. Uh, if more uh, Western medicine adopted, it could really uh, change the way we practice and, and the way we are as patients. And that is this idea that um, each of us is and should be the ultimate authority on our own health and condition. And, you know, it's not like when you take uh, the car to the auto mechanic and he doesn't fix a carburetor right and then you take it home and it doesn't work and you can call him up and chew him out. You take If you take yourself to the doctor and he doesn't fix what's right, it's just as much your responsibility, if not more, uh, to figure that out. Would you basically agree with that? Well, I think really the whole purpose of, of Dr. Traeger's work and the purpose of, of my work is to bring a person into a, a immediate conscious possession of their body and a sensory awareness of, of uh, where the pieces and parts are, how they interrelate, how they move, how they respond to the environment, how they respond to all, all sorts of inputs. And there are three pillars of, of that, that growth of consciousness, growth of somatic consciousness to me. And the foundational uh, stone, or pillar if you will, is um, sensory awareness. If you are not aware of your body on an immediate sensory level, it's kind of a far away distant entity over which you have very little control. So one of the primary aims of my work is to awaken sensory awareness of the body in its intimate details and its intimate interrelations. Once sensory awareness starts to stream with a stronger, clearer uh, uh, flow of information, then I can move to the next primary uh, uh, coming into possession of myself. And that is learning to access all the means I have within myself, and there are many, of self-regulation. Mm. How do I change a habit? How do I, uh, how do I change a posture? How do I find within myself the means to reorganize myself. I see my body work, my, myself as a body worker as only a catalyst to that process. So once we have self-awareness and once we get, begin to learn how we can regulate ourselves, that leads to the end goal, which is successful adaptation throughout life mm -hmm. and all of its changes and its bumps and grinds and injuries and developments. And this is the goal of my work, not to be a mechanic that fix, fixes a broken part or a, a chemist that adds a, an absent molecule, but as, as a bringer into conscious awareness, the enormous field of, of self-direction and uh, self-development that is, is, is our birthright, is, is our, our little piece in evolution. I think for human beings, the next stage of evolution is not growing a new something. It's learning how to use the resources we've got that we barely scratch the surface of in our private lives and in our social, social lives. Yeah. Well, it's such a, that's such a broad pantheon of subjects when you talk about the uh, idea of self-regulation and, and self-awareness. Right. Uh, and it, it's so much more than... Um, body work or massage or anything like that but it's so interesting that that's the gateway for so many people that you're talking oh, about this well you think about you think about some of the astonishing things people have been able to accomplish with meditation or with biofeedback device loops mm -hmm. um <clears throat> given a little training and giving a little, given a little immersion into this subjective world we call our lives uh, people can learn to raise the temperature in one hand and lower it in the other. They can change their blood pressure. They can change their uh, glucose levels in their blood. They can, I mean, the mind is in control of the show. <laughs> and the vast resource of unconscious intelligence that is guiding all the things that we don't have the capacity or time or multi-track uh, focus to think about how to bring that material up into consciousness so that we can begin to control ourselves, so we can begin to understand how intimately the mind and the cellular life of the body is constantly interacting and reinforcing one another. Mm -hmm. 
this whole business of body mind split it, it, it just actually founders my imagination. <laughs> there is no split. There there's no, there's no separation, right? No, you, yeah. you can't speak of body and or mind. We we don't even have a word in our language for what this unity of body and mind would be. We so we don't have a clear concept of how that might be, but it's in the subjective world of self-awareness, self-control, and successful adaptation, we're accessing that material all the time. Mm. We have to, or we wouldn't survive. Hmm. So, you know, we do body slash mind, body dash mind, body mind, all one word, but <laughs> we still are stuck with the fundamental conceptual basis of there is body and then there is mind. And body is physical and mind is somehow ethereal. But the physical and the ethereal are crisscrossing partners in the lives of our bodies and the lives of our emotions and the lives of our thoughts at every moment. Well, you know, that would, that would go, that does so much to explain the placebo effect or miraculous healings or miraculous remissions. Um, you know, I, I myself have been through one where, you know, I had a knee that was very tore up and making sounds when I moved it. And uh, a woman sat down and did Reiki on me for 10 minutes and stood up and have had no pain since. That's 20 years yeah. ago. And, you know, to it's one of those experiences where you say, well, that's just not possible by what we know about the Newtonian universe. You know, so it, it seems like so much of your work is crossing deeply into uh, the, the quantum field and the understanding, uh, the, the latest understandings of the quantum physics and, and the field and in the power of intention. And all of that is a part of that conscious uh, gestalt, mind, body, emotion, spiritual unity that is us as a, as a single entity, would you say? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, gee, I had a thought that was chasing uh, the edge of my mind there as you were speaking. Um, oh, it'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing, uh, you know, this, uh, the whole idea of uh, the, the person, the receiver of a body work or massage uh, being a conscious partner, um, give us an idea. I have a, a good friend who's a massage therapist. If I don't mention her name, she'll beat me up. Uh, Elisa Gay said that she's going to teach a whole class about how to get a massage, how to receive a massage, because she's got really great clients and they have this great communication. As you say, every session is different. Everything is an issue they're working on and it's all very two-way. How? Uh, what are the advice do you have to somebody who's watching this that's just wants to go get a massage or get some body work, uh, and how do they become a good uh, client? How do they become a good receiver, consumer of the well, body I work? Can, I can speak from my own experience, and uh, it jibes well with uh, the body worker friend you were just uh, mm -hmm. speaking of. And that's it. I consider myself, first and foremost, not a fixer, but an educator, mm -hmm. a teacher. And I'm trying to teach you about yourself. And I'm trying to teach you to respond to me as I'm trying to teach you about yourself. So we have some hope of getting on the same page of what our intentions are and what our goals are and why I'm doing what I'm doing, how you, what your reactions signify, how I need to modify what I'm doing to follow your reactions. So I'm not just the expert downloading something into you or turning a screw here and banging a dent out there. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of my work is educating my clients on how to identify what they're feeling, because this is often a problem in the beginning. We, are, we live in a world that is so disembodied mm. from touch and from emotional intelligence and from muscular intelligence. Everything is so analytical and conceptual in our, in our Western uh, mental framework of things that that's the first step, teaching people to... to First of all, recognize. Second of all, acknowledge. Third of all, find the language to share what it is, in fact, you are feeling right now. Mm -hmm. so, then once we get that established, that's the fundamental pillar of sensory awareness. Then as their feelings and their sensations become uh, clearer to them, as I'm manipulating the body and as I'm stimulating this stream of sensations that I am, I feel a change happen. I say, did you feel that change happen? No. 
Well, wait for the next one. Now, did you feel that change happen? Mm. Oh, yes, I felt something shift. So mm. then we're starting to get on the same page. I'm feeling a shift in the tissue. They are at the same moment feeling a shift in the tissue. Then we've got a conversation going. Mm. Then we can start to read the body and the mind into uh, a different relationship with one another and a more constructive, functional, developmental relationship with one another. But it is all about, uh, it's all about teaching and all about helping the client to understand the significance of their sensations, the significance of their emotions, the significance of, of their beliefs and their conceptual, conceptualizations of the world and themselves. Well, I just love the whole idea that you're not fixing anything, but you're just bringing about this awareness uh, through touch. And, oh, listen, uh, I, yeah. I do not have the power to fix you. Yeah. I have developed a facility for helping you understand how you can fix yourself. But you, you have to be the fixer. It, after all, it's your cells. It's your internal resources. Mm -hmm. It's your life story. It's your aspirations. And how all that works, how that gestalt in its six trillion celled complexity works is far beyond my capacity to grok it in, <laughs> exactly. in like a complete way. <laughs> so our conversation is, is about stimulating your resources and ultimately you are your own healer and all I can be is a flashlight in the darkness. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm fascinated by a couple of things you said that uh, uh, that the uh, the 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 primary sensory organ uh, is the skin. I mean, we think of ourselves as a visual culture, and that the 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 it seems to from our verbal conversation, which is so woefully inadequate to even begin to express the depth of the subject. Uh, it seems to me that the most um, profound language is this language of touch. So we have the primary sensory organ as the, as the you know the body and the skin and the the primary language as touch. This can take us to whole different levels of healing, I believe. And oh, I do too. Yes, I mean Aristotle uh, said so many centuries ago that touch is the primary sense. That uh, touch is the universal sense. There is no living organism that does not have something we would have to call a sense of touch, whether it's a single-celled organism's membrane, which is its skin, which is the medium through which it communicates with the outside world and decides to go here rather than there, mm -hmm. take in this rather than that, eject this rather than that. So, yes, uh, touch is, is a, 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 the oldest and in many ways the most primary source of information about the world that we have. Now, Plato came along and decided that her sense was vision. So Aristotle's uh, uh, philosophy was based very much in, uh, you know, down-to-earth uh, physicalities. Mm -hmm. And Plato's vision became much more involved in a, a visionary, ideal world that exists above and beyond this world, that is more perfect than this world, that is something that we can't quite touch but ever strain to attain. And this was a fundamental split in the whole uh, Western philosophical drift of what our relationships to ourselves in the world was. I'll have to say I'm quite firmly in the Aristotelian camp. It's like, <laughs> yeah. I would have yeah. guessed that. <laughs> I mean, this whole world of ideals is 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 interesting, but I don't I don't grasp its significance for our lives. I mean, well, it seems like we I, I do much better when I am mindful. I'm mindful of my mind. I'm mindful of my body. I'm mindful of how every part of my body is feeling. How the space around me, the light, the sound, you know, uh, paying attention and paying attention to what's happening inside is just so much a part of, as you say, self-awareness and, and sensory awareness. Uh, we, are a we are a universe inside here. Mm -hmm. you know, this is our book. Mm -hmm. If we can't come to grips with ourselves on a sensory, emotional, cognitive level, we don't have much hope of adapting to the world in a, in a sustainable <laughs> way. Exactly. 
Well, uh, Dean Juhan, it's been such a pleasure. We're, we're out of time here, and um, uh, we're going to see you here in November, November 2nd through the 4th, I believe is the date. That's that right? right. Well, yeah. and uh, my goodness, this conversation was just time enough to whet my appetite. <laughs> wet my appetite. <laughs> well, now you know what uh, what it's like here. We call it Peaceburg here. Uh, yeah. Peaceburg. Well, at that conference, I'm going to have three full days to That's talk nice. about this and demonstrate my work and... That's and fantastic. Give, give people who are in those classes uh, a few tools to go home with. That is fantastic. Uh, I wish I were a body worker, massage therapist. I might come up and just say howdy anyway. Oh, please do, sir. Yeah, uh, Seven Springs is a great resort. Have you been there before? I never have. No. Oh, oh, it's a it's a great little uh, not little. It's the biggest resort probably on the East Coast, wow. and uh, lots of fun stuff happening there. Yeah, the, maybe, maybe a little bit of fall colors left, but uh, I'm sure you all have a good time there. Oh, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, Dean Johan, thank you so much for being with us today. All right, amigo. Thank you. All righty. And that absolutely will do it for us today here on the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine podcast. Uh, be sure to check us out on Facebook, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, Stitcher, uh, and uh, possibly some other uh, in places around the net that I don't know about. Uh, thanks again to uh, the bionic man, Mike Sorg at Sorgatron Media is always behind the scenes here. And uh, until next time, yins, be careful out there. Mm -hmm.